Hello, I am Martha Minow, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this session of the COVID-19 and the Law Colloquium at Harvard Law School. I give thanks to so many members of the Harvard Law School community for making this possible, including Dean Manning. Uh, and this session is recorded, so we can post it on the website, and it will be there soon, which you can find on our blog, covidseries.law.harvard.edu. Emily Broadlieb and I developed this as a forum for discussion of the many ways in which legal rules and practices are tested and responding to the challenges brought on by the pandemic. Uh, this is also, also an effort to examine how the pandemic shines a spotlight on the inequities, frailties, failures, and systems-wide uh, difficulties in legal frameworks and institutions, especially burdening uh, those who are marginalized and disadvantaged, notably many people of color, many who are impoverished, uh, and, and the special problems exposed by the massive inequalities in uh, our society. Now, over the course of this fall, we've had colloquia involving over 40 members of the Harvard Law School faculty and staff with discussions supported by a blog and addressing topics ranging from election law to government duties to uh, the food and drug approval of drugs and access to food. Uh, prior sessions, uh, recordings are posted and there's also resources on the blog and future topics include people facing detention in uh, criminal settings uh, and also immigration settings, access to court, legal innovations, treatment of animals, agriculture, um, and uh, environmental issues. Uh, with many thanks to all involved, uh, including Bridget Slater, our teaching fellow, helping today with the questions and answers. If you uh, participants have an interest in asking a question, please use that tab. We turn today to the topic, crucial one, of money, finance, and consumer issues. And it's fitting uh, to return to it today as Congress seems to be failing to devise a new stimulus aid package for individuals, local and state governments and businesses. And as evictions, foreclosures and bankruptcies are on the horizon. We have a ideal panel. Our moderator is Todd Rakoff, beloved teacher and scholar of contracts and administrative law, the Byrne professor here at Harvard Law School and editor of a leading uh, administrative law casebook and leader in uh, national experiments in legal education. He's also an expert on consumer protection law and on the integration of sociological dimensions uh, with the law, for example, in his fascinating book, A Time for Every Purpose. Chris Dasan demonstrates how money and money regulations are crucial sites of governance in her work teaching at Harvard Law School and her scholarship. Uh, where she is the Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law. Uh, and she's also the co-founder of Harvard's program on the study of capitalism and the founder of JustMoney.org. Her books include Making Money, Coin Currency and the Coming of Capitalism, and A Cultural History of Money in the Age of Enlightenment. Howell Jackson is the James S. Reed Jr. Professor here at Harvard Law School and an expert on financial regulation, consumer protection, international finance, and federal budget policy. He has consulted with the United States Treasury, UN Development Program, the World Bank, uh, and a variety of US government agencies, including the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, he edits uh, the Regulation of Financial Institutions Journal and is a director of Commonwealth, a nonprofit organization aiming to strengthen financial opportunities for low and moderate income consumers. Toby Merrill founded and directs the Project on Predatory Student Lending, which represents low income student loan borrowers uh, in predatory lending litigation and legislation and regulatory efforts. She has been particularly a leader uh, in challenging the practices of for-profit and occupational schools and related entities, uh, and in negotiated rulemaking uh, with the Department of Education. National lawsuits uh, against for-profit school fraud and uh, the rights of federal student loan borrowers have been well advanced by Toby's leadership, which has helped to cancel about a billion dollars in uh, student loan debt 
and uh, Time Magazine named Toby uh, in their inaugural list of the 100 next. Uh, and so I turn it to Todd and give thanks to all of you. Well, th thank you, Martha. For uh, we're, we're all going to have to work very hard to earn those introductions. Uh, so last week's uh, uh, webinar was about uh, one of our most common roles, that of employee earning money. And this week is the, if you like, the other side of it, which is the spending of money. And I'm going to uh, ask Howell to start us off and set the scene. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Martha. It's a pleasure to be here. So I am going to try to set this uh, scene with uh, some slides, uh, which I hope are now visible, um, and uh, say a few words that will set up what hopefully will be a very interesting conversation. Um, so we are talking about the economics, as Todd kind of alluded uh, to, of uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And just you know, one way of framing this, um, uh, last week, a study came out estimating the uh, cost, financial cost of the crisis at uh, $16 trillion. That was an estimate that Larry Summers and David Cutler of the Kennedy School did in a, a JAMA uh, piece that came out last week, um, which uh, they break it down into a variety of things. Essentially, $7.5 trillion of lost GDP income. Uh, that won't be earned um, as a result of the pandemic, and then uh, additional costs for health and um, death and uh, mental uh, impairment uh, coming up to a total of, of uh, uh, 16 trillion dollars, which is, you know, almost uh, but not quite uh, a full year's GDP for the United States. So it's a, it's a very significant economic cost. If you want to sort of budget it out per household of four, they come with uh, 200 thousand dollars as the cost of the pandemic. And um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit is just the incidence of this cost, which is something I talk a little bit about in one of the articles that I posted for you to look at, uh, those of you who are interested in the financial side of things. But I, I want to just talk about um, the three buckets and a hose, which is a section that I'm writing for that article now that has to do where the, where the incidents are falling and uh, particularly on individuals. So. Coming into the crisis, um, individuals, uh, many individuals particularly, uh, had lots of debts and uh, very limited savings. And the crisis has um, greatly deteriorated the financial well being of many households. Uh, and this has obviously been inequitably done, but there's losses of income, there's additional expenses. Um, there's just a worsening financial situation of individuals. In some sense, that's where the $16 trillion is falling, uh, at least in part. And we're going to talk about a fair number of interventions. Um, there's been a lot of financial support provided, as, as Martha mentioned, maybe not as much forthcoming as some of us would like, but there has been financial support. Um, there's been a fair amount of deferral of obligations. So. Um, those of us paying taxes had a couple extra months to pay our first quarter um, our, our ta taxes this year. Um, there's been deferrals on student loans and mortgages. And then there's also been a fair amount of forbearance, which is um, moratoriums on evictions and things like that, um, uh, deferrals of payments uh, on mortgages. Um, uh, but I, one thing I would note, and I think it's important to understand is, the deferral uh, and forbearance is simply putting things off. It's not solving a problem. Uh, so in some sense, the uh, liabilities of households are accruing over time. And that's something that one has to be mindful of. And one can paint similar pictures of businesses, uh, big and small, uh, state governments, which I gather we've talked a little bit about in the series already, um, have lost a ton of revenue. They have a lot of additional expenses. They're very much um, underwater as a result of the crisis. And um, of course, so are financial institutions, um, some of whom are forbearing, but some of these losses are going to be put up uh, into financial institutions um, and also into capital markets potentially over time. So you know, one, one of the interesting things is where this $16 trillion worth of losses or whatever the number is, is going to fall. Um, and who uh, is going to bear the costs. And um, you know, one of the things that's sort of interesting is the federal government has been providing support 
for all of these locations so far, most notably with the CARES Act uh, for individuals um, and some limited money for state and local governments. Um, but the state and local government support is uh, one of the stumbling blocks of legislation in part because the Republicans are concerned that the support's being used for old debt as opposed to new debt. Um, um, that's one of the angles. Um, but there's also been support uh, certainly for businesses and uh, uh, small businesses particularly. Sometimes these um, support for small businesses, the PPP program is designed to get support to individuals in terms of replacing wages. So sometimes the support is not going directly to where it's intended to go. Um, and there are gonna be questions about whether it's been efficacious the way we've been doing this. But there's a lot of support coming into the system at various points. And as, as Chris may uh, talk about, since she's an expert on uh, the Federal Reserve, um, interestingly, the Federal Reserve has been doing uh, a lot of things. They did a lot of immediate intervention in the uh, spring when the capital markets were blowing up when the information first came out. Rather bizarrely, the capital markets are doing just fine, thank you, right now. Um, but the Fed has a lot of other programs that are in place that haven't been used very much. And there was, there's an interesting article in the New York Times. They're kind of on the shelf right now. And many of them are collaborations with the federal government and the treasury in particular. So we have these unusual joint ventures of the Federal Reserve System partnering with the um, treasury, uh, which raises some interesting questions going forward about intervention. Um, and it raises questions uh, about whether or not we should be looking for the Fed to pick up some of the losses in the system and to kind of bear those losses. Of course, the losses of the Fed, if they exist, are kind of borne indirectly by the taxpayer. So one of the questions that's in the background here is where the losses, where should the losses ultimately lie? Uh, where they land in the current system uh, with debtor creditor rights and bankruptcy potentially, as Martha was saying, or should they be picked up by the federal government and in some sense, put off to taxpayers in the future. Um, the losses can't be, uh, they can't disappear because the GDP is just not being produced. So one of the things we're working out now is kind of where is the most uh, appropriate way for the losses to bear, which should be so socialized through the government and which should sort of be dealt with through the ordinary bankruptcy system, assuming that it can uh, handle the volume of cases, which is a, you know, a whole other set of issues we might uh, touch upon. So that's, that's my just initial uh, statements, uh, Todd, and I think of passing off uh, with the screen to Chris next, if, if I'm right. Chris next, yes. So I'd also like to start, start with thanks for this, uh, this terrific opportunity. Um, we have a short window, so I'm gonna dive right in and make three points about the relationship of uh, uh, finance to consumers to COVID-19. So point one about finance, <clears throat> as a historian of capitalism, I can tell you that capitalism flowed from a radical change in finance. Three centuries ago, governments revolutionized uh, money creation, they revolutionized the way they produce money. So they delegated money creation to private actors, to banks. Uh, they institutionalized banks as the agents in charge of producing our daily medium. They institutionalized banks as the actors, that is, uh, which would diffuse official money into circulation at the retail level. And that system grew and divided into central banks, commercial banks, shadow banks, uh, which work in the capital market. That is, in a capitalist system, private actors make the blood supply, the medium of the economy within an elaborate system of public support. And they do that by allocating credit in money. That means we have private for-profit actors driving distribution from the ground up. This is not a universal way that markets work. It's an historical innovation, a new kind of monetary hardwiring. That is, this was an experiment of the 17th century that goes viral ac across the globe in the next three centuries. So that's point one about finance. Point two, consumers. Before the COVID crisis, as Howell has said, there was reason to believe that the monetary hardwiring I have just mentioned uh, fuels inequality, that that inequality was dramatically on display before COVID. 
uh, I just have a few samples here. And we're so used to seeing these kinds of graphs that these really are just samples. The rising wealth of upper income families relative to middle income families, the racial disparities in that distribution of wealth. That is, the banked role in money creation and credit allocation is not a neutral one. I believe it has increased productivity by breaking through the bounds of monetary privity that characterized the early world, the medieval world, for example. By the same token, it also appears to increase inequality. That is, it, it may well be redistributive up. This is the context for consumers as the COVID crisis hit. So um, I want to talk a bit then, third, about COVID-19 and the crisis that it brought. This spending ball from the Center for uh, a Responsible Federal Budget shows how the federal government pledged or spent money during the COVID-19 crisis. The slide, I think, raises profound questions for us at the material level when we think about how our system channels money and at the governance level when we think about how we decided or who decided about the allocation of basically $11 trillion, how people understood that decision, what that decision means in terms of our democracy. So just a quick look at the material level first. Um, consider the Fed. The Fed does not spend to small players. It supports commercial banks. It buys bonds from investors. It irrigates capital funding markets by supporting broker dealers there. It supports corporate debt markets. When it stretches furthest, as in this crisis, it lends to larger businesses. Uh, as Hal mentioned, there's an effort to lend to states and municipalities, but that's occurred only on a very limited basis. In other words, the spending total, uh, as calculated by, uh, by the uh, CRFB, allocated of or available is $7 trillion or more, right? So that's twice the annual federal budget. Why does the Fed spend or have the authority to spend so much during the crisis? Because it maintains the monetary hardwiring that I mentioned in my first point, right? It maintains our financial infrastructure. Capitalism is a system that operates by seeding money creation to private actors. Those actors are on the front lines for relief even if they're not too big to, say, to fail, right? There weren't claims that they were too big to fail this time around, uh, as opposed to 2008. But because those actors are the essential hardwiring, we've made them the essential hardwiring of our system. They need to be on the front line for relief. I wanna take that logic of our current monetary hardwiring and look at Congress's spending, uh, also represented in the COVID spending ball. Congress's spending goes through the same hardwiring. So Congress works through commercial banks also, right? Just as does the Fed. That conditions its spending. Congress must borrow to spend. It creates a financial asset each time it borrows a treasury bill or bond. It pays interest on that debt. It, all of that adds up uh, to uh, make up the national debt, pushes up against the debt limit. Uh, so that's the process of spending. If we look at the substance of spending and how money was actually allocated, a big chunk of Congress's uh, uh, appropriation actually is for the Fed, the $454 billion set aside to anchor Fed programs. That's half a trillion. Recently in the news, as Hal mentioned, right, uh, because uh, Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin is somewhat reluctant to allocate it. Congress's direct lending program also goes through the commercial banks. Uh, so the Paycheck Protection Program created by Congress hasn't reached many small businesses insofar as it got stuck right in the allocation made by, uh, by banks. Uh, as far as those businesses it does reach, the PPP was handicapped by conventional patterns of bank lending, including discriminatory under-inclusive reach to communities of color. Finally, even direct individual payments by Congress went through the financial system. There's no other way for them to travel. People were paid more effectively when, in terms of their direct stipend if they had a bank account. If they had no bank account, there was more difficulty in reaching those people and getting payment to those people. Uh, and to, to top it off, those people, uh, in a, uh, to a significant extent, the, the poorest, had to use payday lenders in the interim. So that's the material level, troubling aspects of the material level we see um, 
in the, the COVID-19 crisis. This, the COVID-19 spending ball also raises deeply disturbing questions at the legal or constitutional level. I would say the, the conceptual level. When my con law students look at the ball and the patterns it reveals, they see one issue after another. And I think the public would see these too. I'll put them in legal vocabulary just um, for us as lawyers, but, um, but I think the substance is clear. So there are separation of powers questions. Why does the Fed have unlimited powers to spend to what amount to financial institutions and elites? Why does that lending flow more easily, so much more easily than spending by Congress? Questions about, so that separation of powers, also the structure of Republican government, I would say. Uh, is this pattern part of a social compact? Have consumers consented to this structure of American governance? Do they even know about this structure of American governance? Questions about due process or equal protection. Are we reinforcing race discriminatory structures through our monetary architecture? Are we establishing those structures through our monetary uh, architecture? Are, are we hiding behind the delegation to private entrepreneurs, to banks and investors and evading the responsibility to create a more effective, more egalitarian uh, monetary hardwiring that reached, uh, that reached um, people to, to create social welfare? I could go on, but you get the point. Uh, we face profound issues both at the level of governance and I would say at the level of material justice in the way that we spend money. Uh, what to prescribe, just to end with this, I think it's time to re rethink the structure. I think the structure is the elephant in the room. We have to understand uh, the monetary hardwiring, the architecture of finance, what it does in ordinary times, and how expensive it is in crisis times, and how it may be redistributing income up in both times. If that's right, we have to figure that out. And if it's right, then I think we have to rewire it. Uh, <clears throat> that's uh, quite an agenda, and I'm not. I'd be interested in, in hearing how what Howell thinks about what Chris said. But I think we should first get uh, Toby to present uh, what she wants to present. Well, um, it is very interesting, and I, I hope that in a small way I can pick up on some of those themes. And I, I also wanted to start by just thanking um, Martha and Emily for inviting me to participate in this really interesting conversation. Um, as Martha mentioned, I teach the Consumer Law Clinic and, and run the Project on Predatory Student Lending with Eileen Connor. And our clinic represents more than a million people who've been cheated by predatory for-profit colleges all across the country. And so we think a lot about the corollary problem of student debt from for-profit colleges and about student debt generally. And this is a piece, but it's a really big piece of the consumer debt problem that we're talking about. And it's a good thing to be thinking about and talking about because there's more than one, one and a half trillion um, dollars in outstanding student loans held by 40 million Americans. And other, unlike other big pots of consumer debt, um, most of this debt is owned or controlled by the federal government. Um, so for, for a long time, for, for decades really, the federal government has told us that people like our clients, um, people who come from communities targeted by for-profit colleges, largely communities of color, people who um, are disabled, and um, people who, in particular, Black communities borrow, who have student, um, student loan borrowing at higher rates and in greater amounts and hold student loan debt for longer than in white communities. Um, as, to, as to these groups of people, they, they sign the contract and their obligation to pay back student loans is pretty much sacrosanct and bulletproof. And even if the loans themselves or the schools that people attended or the cost to individuals of carrying this debt for a lifetime are really unfair, that's, that's off the table. There's, there's no changing that. That's what we've been told. But what we've learned in the pandemic, what we're learning now is that something that I think is actually pretty obvious, certainly to lawyers, um, that the federal government as this very large and important consumer creditor actually does have enormous power to alter um, alter the terms of debt or cancel the debt entirely, and that there is extensive executive and congressional authority to lighten the burden of existing student loans. And so I just want to take a step back and briefly explain why I'm talking about the government's power to alter and cancel student debt at all. 
The, the pandemic has revealed that this $1.6 trillion in outstanding student loans, um, they're not an inconvenience. They're not like a monthly credit card bill. They are for so many people, an enormous financial hardship. They're both a cause and an effect of inequality that requires intervention by federal policymakers. And depending on where you started, the pandemic has either revealed or reminded you that um, student loans are preventing people from affording food, um, from getting and staying in housing, and from exercising the freedoms that an education is supposed to provide for so many people. And these effects aren't neutral across the population of people seeking higher education. Um, in particular, as I mentioned, black students have to borrow more. They're more likely to carry more debt for a longer time. Um, they're more likely to default. Um, and this it's a long-term financial dr drag and it contributes to the deep and widening wealth inequality in this country that Christine was talking about. And so I just wanna be really explicit that student loans are creating and contributing to racial injustice by continuing and reinforcing um, the wealth and education deprivations that for a long time were enforced by law. They're now being reproduced by student loans. And in this context, the pandemic has really pulled back the curtain on the government's supposed inability to control this metastasizing student debt problem because COVID has made absolutely crystal clear two things that, again, have been pretty hotly contested up until recently. One, that the government can suspend and two, that the government can cancel existing student loan debt. And so I just wanna start with suspension. Um, the CARES Act, so, some sliver of that spending ball um, under the CARES Act suspended student loan payments and collections and the accrual of interest from March through September. And then in August, the president announced that this suspension would continue through the end of the year. And um, each of these actions are ones that um, people who have been struggling with student loan debt for a long time have been told at various points the federal government couldn't do and all of a sudden they could be done. And um, there's some interesting mechanics here. As, as I think Hal mentioned, the interest rates on these loans, they were temporarily set to zero. And again, before COVID, if you'd asked, you would have been told the interest rates on federal student loans are set by Congress and there's, they basically couldn't be changed after the loan was made. Of course, that's not true. Um, moreover, the Department of Education has a whole slew of policies requiring payments, even in circumstances of extraordinary hardship. Um, going so far as to seize earned income tax credits and social security benefits from low-income families to repay defaulted federal student loans. But all of a sudden, um, the means tests that are attached to repayment programs um, and concerns about windfalls and undeserving borrowers unfairly relieved of student debts have disappeared. Um, and they've been replaced, I think, by a belief that clearly the best thing is for nobody, no matter their circumstances, to be spending out of pocket on federal student loans right now even people with graduate degrees, which is, it's just um, sort of the, the tip of the issue for a lot of people. And here's the most interesting thing to me about the suspension of student loan payments. Because the months of suspension still count towards student debt forgiveness programs like public service loan forgiveness and um, income driven repayment um, forgiveness plans, the suspension isn't merely a deferral, it's actually a very, partial cancellation of debt because the government won't recover on those payments on the back end. So even though for, for many people, it looks like a, a deferral or um, a forbearance as Hal was saying, it actually represents for a small, small amount for a small group, a cancellation. And so this leads to, to the other pandemic revelation, which is the federal government actually does have the authority to cancel federal student loan debt. And not only did the the CARES Act do so by statute in the narrow circumstances that I just mentioned, but the Department of Education also did so during the pandemic um, all on its own. So on March 20th, the Department of Education suspended student loan payments and the CARES Act didn't um, set interest rates to zero until March 27th. And so the interest that accrued between March 20th and March 27th was canceled. The Secretary of Education canceled it um, using the authority given to her in the Higher Education Act to settle or compromise um, federal student loans. Um, and just to be clear, this, this settlement and compromise authority is not limited to COVID. It's certainly not limited to interest. Um, it's the same authority that Senator Warren relied on in her campaign's debt cancellation 
plan and that she and Senator Schumer are relying on in their current call for executive um, cancellation of $50,000 in federal student loans for every borrower. And what I take from all of this and what I see looking forward is that the federal government has shed the illusion of limitations on its authority to cancel student loan debt and, and is now acknowledging and using this as a lever um, for economic and well, for economic well-being. Um, as I, I've said a few times, the, the federal government um, holds or controls over a trillion dollars of this household debt and um, pretty much none of that debt is owed by rich people. So the big change um, I see is, is in what the government couldn't do when it was just for our clients to wipe, to wipe away debt because it was incurred by fraud or debt that was unpayable due to disability or poverty. It's cleared the path now to do it for everyone. Um, and in fact, the Trump administration has started to do it. And it's one of those rare points, of uh, extremely rare points of Trump, DeVos, Schumer, Warren agreement. And so looking out into the future, um, it's my hope that um, the continued punitive enforcement of student loan debt, especially against you know, the communities that we serve, uh, will be seen for what it is, which is not an unavoidable and legally required outcome, but an affirmative policy choice to sustain and deepen economic inequality. So uh, I, I think we probably all have questions uh, to ask each other, uh, as well as from the audience. But I just wanted to uh, mention uh, that uh, all three of the panelists so far have spoken about very large institutional players. Uh, it's not as significant monetarily, but it's worth remembering that disruptions such as we've seen over the last uh, several months also bring out the, uh, the greed inherent in a lot of individuals as well. And there's been uh, a substantial amount of fraud in people selling uh, snake oil of one ver version or another, uh, or in claiming government benefits uh, of one version or another. And there's also been um, uh, so a non-trivial amount of profiteering. Uh, so this is uh, toilet paper and paper towels and hand uh, purifiers and so forth at extraordinary uh, prices. Um, some of that's been, you know, on a mass scale and through Amazon and so forth. Um, there, in, in fact, profiteering is against the law in um, more than half the states. In more than half the states, there's a statute that once a public emergency is declared, uh, things of necessity uh, can only be sold at uh, difference by state, but a certain markup from the traditional price as opposed to the wild prices that we've seen. But um, it's been very hard to enforce those statutes because they're state statutes and a lot of the commerce involved is interstate commerce and there is no uh, parallel federal uh, statute, although um, a public citizen and some others are advocating uh, to get uh, such a thing. Um, with that said, I, I guess I wanted to just start off by asking how whether he agreed with Chris. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm happy to say that I always uh, find Chris's work uh, enlightening and challenging and interesting. Um, I, 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 sort of, I have a couple of reactions to, to Chris and, and Toby. So first on Chris, um, I, I think, you know, a, 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 a common, you know, uh, establishment reaction to the pie chart and the amount of money that the Fed is allocated is, is, dis, is discussed to have. I mean, of course, some part of it hasn't been spent, so it sort of is available but unused. Um, and then there's a separate question about money going out as loans uh, that are going to be repaid. And clearly, liquidity is support, but um, at least classically, what the Fed is supposed to be doing is providing liquidity, which is support but it's quite different than the kind of assistance um, that's coming into the CARES Act that, you know, much of which is going to individuals. So that's just one way to, to you, you can slice up those balls in different ways. But I think overwhelmingly, Chris's point is right, that the financial system that we have is a product of political choices. And, um, you know, I take a slightly more optimistic view because 
our financial system, you know, for periods of decades uh, in the last century, did increase income equality. Uh, there was a tipping point uh, in 1980, the, the Piketty's work that shows things begin going in, in, in the wrong direction. Um, but that, you know, that suggests to me that we can make political choices uh, to push things back. And there's, you know, there's a variety of ways one could, could think about how to do that. And you know, that's gonna be very much on the agenda uh, if there's a new administration. Um, so, you know, I, one thing I just want to say about Toby's is there's only one thing I would correct about her um, uh, presentation, which is it's too modest um, in that, you know, when she says uh, Senator Warren came up with a plan, well, Senator Warren came up with Toby Merrill's plan or Toby Merrill provide the opinion uh, that Senator Warren relied upon to make her proposal. And, um, you know, what you, what you just saw right now is actually excellent lawyering. Uh, she's finding uh, a couple of examples where something is being done. And, you know, a lot is being done now in the emergency space. Um, we're doing things as emergency. So, you know, there's a lot of people saying, geez, these eviction moratorium are not okay, appropriate. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the the defense side is it's emergency and it's okay. The opposition side is, is it's a taking of property. But um, you know, Toby's right that you can look inside and see a couple of weeks where uh, there was suspension without statutory authorization. And there's clearly been more experimentation right now. And the, and, and the question is whether you can convert that into uh, wide ranging administrative authority to have complete forgiveness or whether other countervailing um, principles would you know, uh, be more persuasive to courts once we're out of the you know midst of the crisis and that's you know it's it's sort of going to be a question whether administratively it can be done into an interpretation of law that that toby's is is probably the foremost person in in marshalling the arguments or whether the view is this should run through congress and be validated in an express way uh by you know an appropriation and authorization to do a wholesale uh, forgiveness or, or largely one so it's it's but it's a totally fascinating thing. It's, and this is, you know, my sense is the Biden folks are thinking hard about this question and as are people in Congress. So this is a very much a live issue of whether we're gonna go to forgiveness on this kind of debt and if so, to whom. Uh, so Chris, uh, maybe I, I let uh, pass the ball back to you, but add on a question that we got from the audience from Annie Kapnick. Uh, the, my question for Professor Dasan is, what do you think the biggest, single biggest funding error in the CARES Act was? Uh, in the CARES Act. Uh, and how can we prevent such errors in the future? Or maybe I could broaden that to say the single biggest error in what we've done so far. Okay, so um, so uh, it's a pleasure to hear from Howell, and in some ways I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send the ball back to him with, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in the following way. So, so first to the point that um, the Fed is doing a different kind of spending. I think the Fed is doing a different kind of spending. It's making loans that we hope will get repaid. The same could be said, of course, about student debt. Right? <laughs> you know, um, we're hoping that, that, that we're making loans that are sustainable to different institutions. And so my point is, you know, when we step back and think about you know, the Fed as a backdrop or as a lender of last resort or as an intervener into monetary policy, it is using real money and making real guarantees and, and, and mobilizing a real, uh, um, a huge administrative um, institution to make real interventions. So I guess my, my point is not to deny that there are differences between the kinds of loans that we're making, but to ask whether the system, and I think, and I hear how is you know is sharing this concern is still operating effectively, and is um, hasn't it may have become too expensive, too inequitable to keep operating this way. I think he is um, uh, on the same page there. And and to take that to a second point, I actually think the banking system has increased productivity greatly compared to the. I mean, I spent a long time in my own work in the medieval world, right? and it's not a pretty world. It's not a pretty place. Um, and the uh, design innovations that brought banking were really interesting, you know, ingenious design innovations. 
Uh, in particular, they moved us away from link harnessing all money, linking it to commodity uh, to uh, commodity uh, supply. Having said that, and this I think um, this is where it seems to me I go back to Howell. Having said that, we can you know when you actually look at the history, it's as if the people innovating banking backed into it. They stumbled into it. They were innovating and impro improvising, and we've never stepped back and actually asked ourselves about all the other ways that we could create money and diffuse it into circulation, that we could create and allocate credit, or we've rarely asked those questions, right? We're, we're working with an enlightenment system, a system that is from the 18th and 19th centuries, and while it's developed all sorts of um, interesting new aspects, uh, we've never stepped back and reassessed all the myriad other ways that we could diffuse money into circulation, or you know, we've stumbled upon them, but there's much more work to be done here. And that's what brings me back to Howell. I think we need people with the kind of knowledge he has of the financial system to, to think about the innovative ways that we could both repair this system and just innovate anew, right? Different, you know, whether it's public banks or, you know, direct deposits at the Fed or postal bank. I mean, they're all, we're now seeing these proposals come up and they need serious, um, serious evaluation. Uh, what's the single biggest mistake we made in the CARES Act? I think the CARES Act, um, if I could fantasize, I don't think this is the single biggest mistake because I don't think this was on the table, but if I could fantasize, I would, uh, would suggest that Congress spend money directly to Americans, not go through banks, actually direct issue dollars that didn't go through the banking system and that reached American consumers directly, like the old greenbacks or the old uh, you know, direct issue dollars. So I would have um, uh, tried something like that. I, don't, I think it would be enormously difficult because, and maybe this is the last point um, about the architecture, we have an architecture that's very highly entrenched. It's not always possible to repair that in a crisis. I'm not saying that 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 the federal government should have drawn back and not made interventions either by the Federal Reserve or by Congress. I'm saying that now that we see how difficult and how expensive our system is in crisis, and we've had two crises in you know two decades, now's the time actually when we get the crisis under control to revise it. So, so Todd, if I, can I just re respond sure, for a second on, on that? I mean, um, I think, you know, Chris, the, the reimagining is a helpful thing. And to, and to some degree, um, there are many ways you could reimagine, but you want something that's dynamic and more flexible. And, you know, FinTech, broadly speaking, offers many different possibilities. And there are lots of people playing with kinds of solutions that might do the sort of thing you are contemplating and connect people up with the federal government in a way that would allow for helicopter drops or what, whatever, uh, whereas we sort of had to rely on the financial system and they favored their own customers and they made sweetheart deals and we're gonna be having congressional hearings for the next you know, four years about how bad that was and how many profiteers there were um, out there. Um, but you know, one thing I would say, Chris, is you know, I, I don't really get a chance to say this to you, but I think you need to think more broadly um, because the problem uh, is not just with the financial system. I think if you sort of do a retrospective, um, there's an absence of resilience in our economy in lots of places, including at the individual level. I mean, one of the, the problems is there's not enough emergency savings and wealth. There's People are too leveraged and actually companies are too leveraged too. And there's a hundred choices we've made throughout our legal system um, that has leveraged us up on many dimensions, including the federal government is, is super leveraged coming into the crisis. And now we're at World War II levels. Um, so, um, you know, I think there's many things that we might want to rethink uh, coming out, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop with the financial system. Yeah, and I would say those things are connected. You know, the amount of debt that people are holding, as Adair Turner would argue, it, you know, yeah. is directly related to the the redistribution of income up, right? So people at the bottom have to borrow, is his argument. So I, I guess I do think of that as part of the financial system, but happy to you, include it. You in already the have that turf, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Toby, there's a question I've been uh, I wanted to ask you. 
I don't know whether I'm asking you a legal question or a political question, but uh, when you think about the question of student debt, uh, is it important either legally or politically to, to connect the individual student's uh, complaint to a specific wrongdoing, for example, a for-profit school that advertised that it's uh, graduates did, you know, got jobs and in fact, none of them have ever gotten jobs or something like that. Uh, or is it sufficient to sort of say student debt has become such a economic problem that we're just going to start all over if you want to put it that way? Um, I, I think it's a, a legal question and a political question. And maybe I can take them one at a time because, and I like to think about it actually in, in the terms that Martha used in her book about um, forgiveness in law. There's a there's a category of forgiveness that doesn't, well, there is a category called forgiveness that doesn't um, that doesn't necessarily respond to um, a legal claim of right. Once I have a legal claim of right, you could say getting rid of this debt isn't forgiveness; it's cancellation. I'm um, this debt isn't legally enforceable because it was incurred on the basis of fraud, um, that's not forgiveness, that's cancellation. And that, at least those are the terms I use in the way I think about it. And so in that sense, you know, all of our clients and all of the people who've been cheated by for-profit schools, those people have a legal claim. To, as to them, student loan debt, it's, it's not problematic or unjust, it's unlawful. Um, and the fact that we keep enforcing it in these extremely harmful ways, um, it's, it's not, a, it's not only a moral problem, it's a legal problem. And that's why litigation is an effective tool in that arena. But as to people who um, got what they were promised or were expecting, who, who are just trying to participate in the higher education system as extraordinarily expensive as it is and um, have become some of the holders of, you know, a truly extraordinary amount of debt, um, for them, it's, it's the political question and, and it's more on the forgiveness level. And that's where the answer becomes about how is the distribution of student loan debt affecting um, what opportunities people have and what opportunities which specific people have. That's where we need to look at the questions about inequality um, and, and the long-term meaning that this debt has for people. And that's where I think you could say there's a political answer, which is that it's not only better for the people holding this debt for us to change course, but it's also better for everyone else. Um, like I think we can see how the um, like debt servitude of an entire generation of young people is really going to be harmful to our democracy overall. And so that's not a, a question um, right for litigation, and I don't think it will ever be like litigation is not an effective tool in that um, in answering that question. But I think that. The sum of the litigation that we do is effective in at least gesturing toward that question, and I think it's there. The two questions are closely related. But if if so, taking the 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 second half of it, the, the people who are burdened with the debt, but they got they got some value. It's just that they're still burdened with the debt. Um, isn't isn't solving that problem at least going forward going to require the same kind of broad institutional rearrangement that Hal and Christine are talking about in terms of the uh, financial system. Uh, and it, it's, let me just go on and say, it's not clear to me that just saying, well, uh, college should be free uh, solves that problem because college should be free also is if we're saying the people going to college are the people who presently go to college is saying we're creating a program for the better off people in the society that's going to be borne by the society as a whole. Right. If there's an access problem and an equity problem, and then there's a funding structure problem, and they're all linked together in our current system where um, you get the predatory for-profit colleges making the argument that they're providing access to people who hadn't been provided been able to access higher education before, but in fact, what they are providing access to is, you know, the the college version of an exploding toaster, <laughs> and um, 
and then separately, I think you're also separating out the question of like canceling the debt and having free college or, or not having a debt financed higher education system, which are of course analytically distinct questions, but part of this same undertaking of how do we reimagine a system of higher education that serves everyone and that doesn't create um, this universe of debt. Right. I'm just restating your question because I don't know the answer. Right. I mean, I think historically here, it's an interesting fact that something like California, which is a well studied system, much more public support, um, you know, sustained the uh, university system out there for many decades. Then there was a choice made in roughly the 1980s that California residents didn't want to pay taxes and they reduced their public support and increased, you know, the debt burden on individuals. And so we've, you know, we've gone from a system Todd, when you and I were in college, that if you were careful, you could sort of pay your way through college and um, it was relatively affordable, whereas you've gone to a system where if you're not well off, um, you're going to be, you know, certainly incurring a fair amount of debt. And we've just sort of, we've, we've monetized education in a, in a destabilizing kind of way. Um, so even, even after we forgive, we've got, there's a, there's a, there's another step that, you know, Toby is, is well aware of, of of how do we make sure we're not in the same position 20 years down the uh, line and that that requires other institutional changes. Right, yeah. and not only in terms of not recreating the, this um, debt burden, but also in terms of not recreating the um, social hierarchies of who can access higher education and avoiding the trap that I think some people fall into when they think and talk about this of um, you know, perceiving vocational education to be an acceptable offering for one group, but not for everyone. Yeah. Can I just say at a very high level of abstraction, part of what's exciting about this panel is these kinds of issues and Todd, the questions you were asking about the scale of institutional design that we need to think about. Um, uh, the abstract observation is just that this kind of panel is, uh, I would hope would encourage people who are watching lawyers um, institutional designers, right, to start bringing their talents to these questions, right, not to leave them to economists or um, to, uh, you know, to even to educators, right, not to silo them, but in fact, to think of them as real, real institutional challenges in which we actually have a lot to offer as people who think about the institutional level of, you know, the connections between access and funding and the economy and uh, uh, that in that dimension, I think that's how we have to be thinking. Right, and also, you know, whatever scheme in this country, at least whatever schemes we come up with have to be implemented by lawyers and mm -hmm. be implemented by lawyers who can, who can think about them as design, as design. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, well, I think we've uh, pretty much uh, reached the end of our time, which is kind of, uh, fair given that Chris has just given an assignment to everybody <laughs> who's listening or watching uh, to take it take it further in the future, uh, which we certainly hope uh, you will. So I want to thank the panelists uh, for spending the hour and uh, it was certainly an enjoyable hour for me too. And uh, I'm not sure what what is next. I think someone's going to come on and can I just, just say one other thing Todd, sure. to the audience, which is uh, when we signed up to this panel, I can't remember exactly what I signed, but there was a component that if there are students out there who were interested in doing the kind of stuff that Chris is talking about, uh, you know, we panelists have, have agreed to, and I, I gather there's people looking for writing projects in January now, all of a sudden, at least at Harvard Law School. So, um, you know, I think we're resources for people who want to get ideas or, or kick things around. And the blog that um, Emily and Martha's team put together has a lot of really good stuff that uh, you know, amplifies you know, some of the things we've been talking about. Great. M Martha, we can't hear you. Thank you all. That was fantastic. And absolutely, uh, writing opportunities for independent papers or contributions to the blog. Uh, if uh, I can have a lightning round, if there were one big uh, reform that would be available, which of these would be your priority or something else? Devise an alternative to reliance on big banks, 
through fintech or other vehicles to manage finances and payments. Uh, create a one-time debt forgiveness applied to people below a certain income level or maybe a sliding scale. Uh, or adopt an equity impact statement about the likely effect on income and wealth inequalities of any future large expenditures by Congress. Anybody? Sorry, Martha, what was number one? I'm Congress sorry. There was an alternative to reliance on big banks for payments, uh, uh, either through fintech or other vehicles that ordinary people have, smartphones, for managing finances and payments. Could, could I take there. three with a with a twist and say it? I don't think an equity impact statement is going to get us all the way to where we need to be. I think it's an equity impact requirement, and I would love that would if with that twist, I would take it a hundred times. I would I would take that one too because it would be a counterbalance to the uh, to my view un unfortunate uh, domination of things by cost benefit analysis. And it would give an, an alternative way of looking at things. I'm not sure I'd, I'd take one off of your list, although your list is a good one. If if I could have anything come out of this, I would have it considered to be an obligation of all employers to make sure that their employees aren't just saving for retirement, but actually have a an emergency safety net for themselves. So I, I would kind of make that um, you know something that we just expect every company to make sure that its employees are getting and maybe having reporting on how well they're doing. Um, but I, I think if getting getting people resilience and away from the payday lenders that uh, Chris alluded to would, would actually make a huge dis difference in pandemics and in non-pandemic times. I'm sure you're right. Uh, of course, the moral hazard question is very much uh, in discussion. So people who did save and have an emergency cushion and maybe won't get the benefit of forgiveness, this is gonna be a debate going forward. But this was a ter terrific discussion and you've elevated our sights and I give our thanks and look forward to future work. I hope by Harvard Law students and others. Uh, thank you so much.